Hello, you're listening to the State of Startups with Industry Analysts. We shine a light on the interplay of startups, their ecosystem, and industry analysts in the B2B tech space. That is, real experiences from real people solving the same challenges that you're dealing with, too. You're hosted by Chris Holscher and Robin Schaefer. Enjoy this session. Hello, everyone, and hello, Chris. Hey, Robin. Hey, today we had Rose Ross, uh, who runs a VR firm out of London, O Marketing, and is also the founder of the Tech Trailblazer Awards for Enterprise Tech Startups. Rose shares all the details of this unique award program that I think all tech startups should enter. Absolutely. And I find it really interesting. Um, and it's also very timely because it's actually happening right now. The uh, the deadline for applications is August 21st, 23. Um, so uh, listen to what Rose has to say, and you may want to hop onto their website and, and check this out for you. Absolutely. So we also had a great chat about Rose's view on analyst relations from her perspective as a PR expert. Which is so important. PR and AR must play together. If they don't, um, it can mean real problems. And you may have seen the data in the uh, state of startups with industry analyst research. Um, however, if PR and AR do play together, it can be such a power play, such a dream team. So especially for a startup. So really important. Yeah, yeah. So Rose talked about three things. How, when, and why a startup needs to work with analysts and the kind of support startups need to optimize the relationship with industry analysts. And then third, best practices, how AR and PR should work together to multiply their efforts. Exactly. Let's dive right in. All right. This is Robin Schaefer. I'm here with my uh, partner in crime, Chris Holscher, and our guest, Rose Ross. And we are very happy to have you here today, Rose. But why don't you tell our guests about yourself? Well, thanks, Robin. Thanks, Chris. I'm delighted to be here. My name's Rose Ross, and for a good couple of decades, I've run a PR company called O Marketing, based in the UK, that focuses on enterprise technology clients, a lot in cybersecurity and other areas. But also for the last 12 years, I've been the founder and the chief trailblazer of the Tech Trailblazers Awards, which is an awards for enterprise tech startups. Oh, that's so good. Uh, tell us more. I, I'm really curious about the Tech Trailblazers. I want to get to the other work too, but I'm so curious about that program because I've heard of it and I think startups are not not as aware of it as they should be. And I think it's a fabulous program. Well, that's certainly my mission. I'd like every single enterprise tech startup that's eligible to at least be aware of it. Obviously it'd be great if they participated, but at least to be aware of it being an option. So that's the first thing. So it sprung out actually of our PR work. We were working for an exhibition in London uh, about 13 years ago and we had an idea as a campaign for them to have kind of a startup zone which focused and had an award so people could participate in the awards and the winners would then get pods in their startup zone. Unfortunately it never got off the ground for that particular exhibition but I kind of had it in my head that it was still a really good idea and um, I spoke with Joe Bagley, who I'd known for a long time. He's the CTO Emir for VMware. Mm. And we were out having a chat outside the exhibition. I said, oh, it's not gone anywhere, but I really think it's a good idea. I said, but I can't really see anybody being up for this if it's backed by a PR company. It just doesn't make sense. You know, people wouldn't really get the logic of it. I said, the only way it's going to work is if we have some real stellar judges to give it some credibility. And I said, I don't suppose you would consider being one of our judges. And he said, yes, absolutely. I think it's a brilliant idea. At the time it was called the Global Innovation Awards, which was okay. Uh, and then obviously we had the, the light bulb moment that, hey, how about tech trailblazers? These guys are startups, they're trailblazing, they're in tech, had a real nice ring to it. Yes, so. Yeah. 
as they say, and that's how an awards is born. Um, so that, that's the story behind it. Um, in addition yeah. to that, um, focused on enterprise tech completely. So not looking at, at consumer tech at all, because I've seen from my experience working primarily in that space, there were very few awards that would address that area specifically. You might have a, a category for enterprise tech, but a lot of the, the effort and a lot of the energy in those types of awards at that time was very much focused either on one particular sector, right. which was great. So it would be just around cyber, just about storage, or it would be, and that meant that you were competing with the big boys. You know, there were startups in the in the same arena. You know, you were right, queen, yeah. and you know, you were a little startup punk band trying to take on them in that sort of kind of way, which I didn't think really worked for most people. Because you know, if you weren't that well known, and if it came down to a public vote, you just weren't going to get the the momentum, the support. Or alternatively, it was for tech startups, but then you were competing with the, you know, the cool, funky apps and gadgets. And again, you were there, therefore going to be disadvantaged potentially. So I felt that there was a space for people who were, you know, competing with their, with their, the same kinds of companies. Yeah. So it was a fair competition. Yeah. yeah. So they, they were, you know, on a level playing field, so to speak. Yeah. That's how it came about. That makes a lot of sense. It is now. Remind me, Rose. Uh, when did all that start? I'm not sure you said it, but uh, when did when did it start? Um, we started in 2012, so we're in our 13th year now. So, oh, <laughs> yeah, oh, not bad, eh? not bad. <laughs> well, tell, us about, a lot. tell us about how many startups uh, you know enter and are aware of it, and how much uh, energy you have. And then also, we're going to put in the show notes. But if you can tell how the startups can participate. Um, yeah, sure. So we've kicked off entries this week. So very timely. Uh, the early bird entries for those that are payable awards, which is the tech categories themselves, is um, the deadline for early bird is the 31st of July 2023. And then we close the applications completely on the 21st of August this year. So plenty of time, but obviously we'll, I'd encourage people to get going because, you know, they want to make make the time available and ensure that they can put their best foot forward in, in the competition. Um, can you, can you give us a scope of the, of, of the uh, categories you're, you're looking sure, into? Sure, absolutely. So, I mean, just, just to go back to Robin's question about the number of startups, we, we usually feel somewhere around 250, 300. I think that's what we had last year. It, it's growing considerably and I don't know whether that's because we're virtual and people are starting to understand we've built up momentum and people have got got us in the diary so to speak to mm -hmm. to check in and be part of we've had a lot of support from the PR community which I'm super proud of because you know a lot of people could go oh you know that's that's run by a PR team I wouldn't want to get involved with it but they're very keen to get their their startups involved which is phenomenal um, yeah, so category wise, we have a number of tech start, uh, sorry, tech categories, which is where we started everything and then we evolved from there. So we now have AI, big data, blockchain, cloud containers, which is the cloud native side of things. We also have uh, developer. We also have IoT, fintech, mobile, which is now telecoms, networking security which is cyber and also storage i bet i've forgotten one so apologies to oh fintech IT. no i think i've covered them all but i've probably have forgotten one so apologies to everybody in that sector <laughs> and what do you consider um a startup like what what is the qualification to enter how so we jiggled around interestingly enough during covid we jiggled around because we gave everybody an extra year because we felt that we kind of all lost a year so now it's seven years and younger. Okay. To participate. What is it? Yeah. Sorry, six years and younger. So they can be in their sixth year and younger. Um, and they obviously need to be um, funded, not beyond where we think it starts to become a little bit too mature. So we say it can be privately funded in any way, whether it's VC or um, you know angel seed funding or privately funded. But with the VC, we we cut it off at Series C. 
So if they've gone beyond Series C, then they're no longer eligible. Okay. But five years or five or now six years is the is the yeah. Uh, so originally it was five years old or younger, and now it's six years old or younger. Okay. That's a pretty um, young company. That's exciting. Yeah, and in addition to that, we because those are, those are the chargeable. Um, the ones that we then decided is there some which were very young, but we still wanted them to feel they could be part of it. And obviously, even though it's not an awful lot of money, you know, the early bird is two nine five, but it still could be a barrier. So we wanted to break that down so we could get the really young pre VC funding companies involved. So that is free of charge, and that is the fire starter bursary. Oh. So they can enter into that, which is standalone category, but they can also then go into their own tech category. So they are also then competing with the others. So we felt that was a nice way of kind of nice. ensuring everybody could be involved if they wanted to be. Oh. Oh. Um, and in addition to that, we introduced some other ones. So about six or seven years ago, we introduced female and male trailblazer, which is also free to enter either with a tech category or standalone. And that's to represent and recognize people who within startups have been excelling within leadership, agility, nurturing innovation, being part of the, the community and also championing diversity. So those are the, the kind of the criteria we look at on all of those aspects to select those exceptional people. Um, and in addition to that, we also have a diversity award, which is to look at diversity within startups. And in addition to that, there's an investment um, trailblazer, which is for anybody. It could be a government agency, it could be a bank, it could be a lawyer firm could be accountancy firm, an accelerator, or even a big corporate who are doing amazing things to nurture that investment innovation and support startups. So that's exciting too. And I forgot, I now know, I can remember which one's the one I've forgotten, sustainability oh, nice. <laughs> is the other tech category. I knew I'd get there eventually. All right. Pretty robust. Yeah, we wanted to try and cover everything that was likely to be of interest to people in enterprise tech. Yeah. So. Good. 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 So um, we'll put in the show notes, as I said, the at the uh, how you sign up. That's is it. Sure. What's the URL? You can just say it. Uh, it's, it's just techtrailblazers.com. Dot com. Okay, so that's where, and we'll put it in the your in the show notes too. But sure. go today if you're a startup and and apply. It's exciting. It's a great way to get some attention. We yeah, we have some amazing team. people amazing people involved with it and it's really exciting for us as well to get to know people and you know welcome on the journey and then support them afterwards as well I think that's one of the places that we have kind of said look this is a community we've built yeah. up with our alumni and so we do things like podcasts like this and it's it's a bit strange to be on the other end of the podcast <laughs> um, dynamic um, because I, I get the opportunity, which I love, to talk to our winners, to our judges, and talk about their experiences and how they've got to where they are and where they want to go. Oh, people so, must love that. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's an absolute joy. And, you know, not, not, not many people get to talk about the amazing journey that they go on because it's, uh, yeah, well, it's I... usually a lot of hard work, a lot of hard work to get to where they are. Very good. Very yeah. good. Well, I think I think I, I'm curious to hear a little bit about your your PR hat. Uh -huh. And, um, you know, you've, you've shared your your history and what you've been doing with that. We're always intrigued about the relationship between analyst relations and PR. Right. Because we see a strong there should be a strong connection in many companies. There is not. But mm -hmm. there is um, a lot of value to the PR team and the AR team and connecting with each other. So do you have any feelings about that? Any experience there? I think um, I think after nearly 30 years doing this, I've got a lot of experience. I'd like to think myself, I'm a PR, I'm, a, I'm an AR friendly PR person, if that's the right way of you. putting it. Um, I, I don't understand the depth of AR. Mm -hmm. um, I, I wouldn't be the kind of person who could you know, create the pitch for the magic quadrant. That wouldn't necessarily be my thing. I'm good at the relationship part. So we mm -hmm. we do what I, I guess I would call AR light. 
-hmm. which is much more on the relationship side I don't I don't feel that I think it's a bit like PR as well I mean for startups in particular unless you have people who are fully you know who speak AR or speak PR that it's easy for them to do it so I think that's why you know, a lot of startups as well as bigger companies rely on people who do PR day in and day out. And I think it's very similar for AR. Yes. Um, you know, we do we do ensure that analysts get briefings, but I don't think we provide the same kind of support as, you know, professionals in that. Yeah. That area. I mean, I, I, I believe my hypothesis, my, my understanding is mm -hmm. that most startups will start with PR. They recognize the value of PR and, and will seek support and, and work on PR. They may not be aware of the AR side of the playing field. Mm. But I do you see that? That most companies that you engage in the beginning maybe don't have an AR program yet, but there's a well, connection. I wouldn't say they have a program. I think they have an aspiration. Okay. Um, and I think it's like a lot of things I was trying to think about before we, you know, we're going to speak about how I would describe people to about why these things don't always work. And I think I came up with quite a good analogy. It's a bit like the enthusiasm at the beginning of the year to get fit. We buy a gym membership and then we don't always go. Right. Um, if you go and if you put the work in, then you're going to get fit. If you don't go and just have the membership, then 12 months later, you go, oh, uh, nothing's really changed. Um, and I think that's true for PR and AR, and I'm sure it's true for lots of other aspects within, you know, businesses. Because <coughs> I'm tight. Thank you. Sorry, I was trying to hold that back. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a good thing if we can induce sneezing. And that will um, be proof that this is not edited. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely absolutely so I think that I think that's where it goes and I think that a lot of startups particularly maybe when they first get funding will get some kind of um subscription to an analyst firm well I, I'm not going to mention names because we don't want to have any favorites because they're like all our children and we love them all the same um but yeah I think they don't necessarily get the whole hand, hand sorry hand holding through that experience yeah. you know there's nobody at that gym who phones you up every week and go, where are you? There's a spin class tomorrow. Get down to spin class. That's really what you need. There's no personal trainer. Oh, I would love that. that gym. I would love that. I would love a mommy for the gym. Everybody, <laughs> everybody needs a mommy. She might not always be a nice mommy, though. Because otherwise well, she won't fair. go. She go, it's okay, darling. You can. You don't have to go today. Um, to be fair, I hope you understand also, what you mean. There is also the opposite. There is also the opposite where you may have a really active account executive um, working with you, even, you know, even as a starter and mm. um, trying to, you know, throwing all sorts of goodness at you as a startup. You should do this briefing. You should do that inquiry. Let's yeah. do this document review. Let's do engage in this particular research or whatever. Yeah, and yeah. The, the particularly young companies with, uh, you know, just a handful or two handful of people or even 50 people. Yeah can get overwhelmed with all that and say, well, I, I see there's a whole lot of superpower there, but I, I, I can't handle it, let alone organize it mm. and, and go about it in a structured manner. So um, that's the other kind of extreme that you could also get. Yeah. Totally. You get the, yeah, you get the sort of, well, the very full on mummy. <laughs> yeah, yes. so, yeah. so sometimes you can get the ballet yeah. mummy the one that takes you to judo the one that takes yeah, that, you to ballet you can also learn french violin cello um and you know a million other things yeah that's part that, of that is that the, the right. helicopter mom or the or the tiger mom uh, okay. the terms i've heard about that yeah uh, okay that makes yeah. sense too that yeah. makes sense too yeah i'm sure that's the case i mean i'm probably not close enough to that relationship internally within startups to comment on that but Mm -hmm. Certainly, I think there's there's a lot of power in being able to harness the analysts, just in the same way as the PR. Yep. You know, if you can get those kind of things right, you can really push yourself forward. Perhaps. And I think if you can connect the, I mean, so often I see that these efforts are not connected. They're not reinforcing oh. each other. They're not building on the on, on the relationship between the two communities, the media and the analysts, and building the groundswell 
of their yeah. messaging and their output, you know, and taking mm. you know, making the multiplier effect. They're they're just doing it separately. That's what I see. Yeah, there's the, I mean, we we see this in technology. Let's be fair. I mean, I I think that's probably where I first heard it was the silo approach to these yeah. things. You know, very much in cybersecurity, and we all know that if you take a siloed approach, it is not going to work as well as it could do. And I think that's probably true about lots of aspects, with particularly within startups. Well, maybe not so much. Maybe they're because they've got smaller teams, it's a bit easier to have that communication within the marketing and the comms teams and and such like. But I think it's something certainly that people should look at and give sort of a bit of a pan out a little bit and going, you know what? These guys could work a bit more effectively together if they knew what they were all doing, they could. They could share resources. They could share assets. They could. They can you know, align on the messaging. A lot of times, I don't even see alignment on you know what we're saying to the market. They're different messages. They're not connecting. You know, hmm. and, and that's not going to help anybody. You need to be very yeah. clear with that. You need to. You need to multiply. Have you Have you seen um, models that seem to work well? And and um, I mean between um, PR and and analyst relations. Um, yes, because somebody I worked with actually used to be an analyst before they became a VP of marketing. So they had a really good understanding of that. I mean, they, they obviously handled the analyst relations so they because they were, you know, very up on that side of things. But, you know, we input to a quarterly analyst um, newsletter. We had very streamlined stuff. We used to get involved with the briefings, which we knew were gonna be very on point, which was good for us as well, because we learned a lot about the positioning of the company. You got some great insights from what the analysts did. And I mean, I think that's an advantage, definitely, that would be a, a connector between AR and PR, because I think if PR people are involved with really good analyst briefings, it really helps understand, you know, and we talked about this. I know we talked about this about, would you like to take a briefing? And um, a lot of people would like to just have a conversation because it's very much a two-way street. I think the startups tend to learn just as much from the analysts as the analysts oh, the startup. Totally. No, yeah. no doubt. And also- Especially the ones in the like, real, real niche areas. Oh, well, I also feel like what's so satisfying to me in working with startups is they're uh, their agility and their ability to pivot and take in information. So working with mid-sized and large companies, yeah. it's like, I always say, it's like moving the Titanic. An analyst may give you some, some feedback or some insights that you could do a lot with and could help you, yeah. but you can't, it's just too hard to, to, to steer a little bit differently. And a startup yeah. is just poised to take that input and act on it. And that's what's so exciting because you see the impact. Yeah, totally. I mean, you've definitely got another analogy, you know, the oil tanker trying to move versus a nice, nimble yacht. There you um, go. Yeah. Or dinghy. And they can be whizzing off in a completely direct, different direction very exactly. quickly. Um, it obviously takes effort, but it's going to be a lot easier to do. Totally. So, yes, and I think that must be very satisfying for an analyst if they know they can make a difference like that. That's, you know, oh. Job satisfaction 101. Totally. That's what analysts live for. You know, people... You know, people may have mixed views on analysts and their value and what they what they think and may may have some negativity about them, some of them, you know, but in general, I have found every analyst, when you have a relationship where an analyst can actually put their signature in some way on your business, they feel mm, part of gosh, you. It's like yeah. a human nature thing. It changes the whole relationship when you listen to them, even if you don't do what they say, but you're trusting them as a confidant. Mm -hmm. and you're listening and you're sharing things with them and you're having discussions all of a sudden that analyst is sitting on your side of the table you know they're not on the other side of the table receiving a briefing you know mm -hmm. they're sitting on your side of the table an extended brain as chris likes to say with your company helping you think and now you have an ally and that's very mm -hmm. powerful let's face it in business you want as many allies as you can get particularly when you're starting out. So that's definitely a good thing. And I think, you know, journalists can be the same for companies as well. They're, you know, those relationships are very important to startups. They're important to every business, but oh, I think yeah. particularly for startups, you know, you, you've, got, you've got people championing your cause and understanding what you're trying to achieve. That's, that's priceless. That's priceless. Yeah, it's getting some hearts in it. Yeah, you just mentioned, um, you, you just said, particularly when they start out. Um, hmm. my, 
my experience is that um, you know at these early stages, your what you do in the market is tends to be relatively volatile. Still, you you know you're testing out things, you're you're hmm, piloting sure. um, a product, you may you yeah. know may pivot to an entirely different angle and, and an entirely new vector into the market. And at hmm. these times, it can be super helpful to get this external perspective into your business and all that. But um, I wonder, since you since you work with uh, so many startups of all you know um, very different uh, uh, markets and then also very mm. different sizes, what's your view on when when they should really start out doing this? I mean, we just said the earlier the better, but is there you know it, what do you think? Is there a recommendation or your, your take? If I'm on brutally this? honest, I I talk to analysts before I finalize my business as long as you've got an ironclad MBA. If I was starting a tech startup, you know, bearing in mind I'm not that technical, but I would go, hmm, okay, this could be some worthwhile conversations. I mean, not obviously just at the idea stage, but perhaps if you're still just say three to six months out on step in stealth, yeah, because a lot of these guys have quite a considerable run up to actually going, you know, breaking cover. That's my personal view. I mean, I'm not an expert with regards to that, but I, I don't think it would be invaluable to do that way. Yeah. And just as a reassurance there, I think that matches pretty much what uh, our other guest, Robin, um, I believe it was, um, was it John Collins who said in stealth mode or was it? Or was Martin, it... Martin Kupinger, I think. Ah, yeah. Yeah. Martin Kupinger of yeah. Kupinger yeah. Cole. Yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if John said that either because he's pretty, pretty switched on as well with regards to that. Well, I'm glad that I didn't listen to those and I can't just repeat it. That was, that was just my gut feeling. So it's okay. nice that it's validated. Very good. By an Very analyst, good. which is what everybody needs, right? Yeah, true. And um, I mean, it's, um, I think it's a great way to just test your thinking um, early and not just to say, well, am I right or wrong, but also maybe to discover angles that you haven't even found, you know, and, and to discover Ooh. new new bits of the market that you haven't addressed with the very same idea. Yeah. So, um, yeah. yeah. How, yeah, just, uh, just switching back to the the AR to PR connection. Mm -hmm. One of the most basic things that I have seen most companies fail to do is when they're issuing a press release about an announce something they're announcing. Yeah, including an analyst perspective on it, an analyst quote, and providing an analyst reference to the media to support your story seems like a no brainer to me. And um, I've just seen little to no activity on that. Like I, I'm always pushing to make that happen. It, do, you, do you see that? Does that make sense to you? And what do you it see? It was kind of a standard thing, but I think it became a little bit harder. If, if, if a company didn't have a relationship, then it was a little bit harder to get. Sure, sure. Um, and, I, and I think it depends on the press release itself. I mean, I think if it's a product announcement. Right, right. Really important. That's yeah. really important. To have so you're, you're, you're always seeking that. You're always I, I would recommend. That. I would recommend doing that. Yes, yes. sure. Um, you know, an analyst voice. You want a third party validation voice. Right. So right. an analyst, a customer. I did right. both, but obviously right. you get one. You know, I guess one would be customer, two would be analyst, um, depending on the type of technology. Yeah, I agree. other stories perhaps not so much. But again, you know, if you've got a channel partnership, that that can feel a little bit flat, and just you two saying, "Hey, we're dating." Ha. Who, who, so what? Um, I think if you've got somebody who specializes in the channel who can give it a bit of, bit of color, that would certainly be helpful. Um, I yeah, so. I, I definitely think it's important to, to yeah. explore that, you know, especially yeah. with, with that type of announcement because you have a fair lead up to it. It's not like, oh, look, what a surprise, we've got a new product. Yeah. It's like, you know, it's coming, right? <laughs> you can prep for it. So as long as the, the product, team keep you posted then that should be viable well it's it's that's, that's the value of a smart pr person to recognize that because i just haven't always encountered those you know that mm -hmm. and see that connection and value it and i'm kind of bringing it up and they're saying oh that's a good idea it seems like table stakes to me yeah, the only I problem you don't want to the then idea. send that press release to analysts that aren't that analysts because i think that would be seen as being a little bit in, impolite well, so you just I have to it, balance it out a little bit. 
I think it, it demonstrates really, we spoke earlier about the relationship with PR and AR, and um, many companies simply send their um, their um, press releases over to the analysts, you know, and, and treat them just like another influencer or so. And yeah. um, that really shows, uh, the example that Robin made really shows uh, how the relationship should rather be. You should consult your analysts before you send make your press release. You should get their uh, take on it before it. And um, you should use that interaction with your PR people to help them craft an even better PR piece, you know? Mm -hmm. So um, it's not just, you know, uh, use it for this thing too and throw it out. Um, but no, 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 uh, work together in a coordinated way um, so that you can leverage the strength of the other because AR people are not, yeah, are not excellent at crafting great PR pieces. No, we're, we're good with text, okay? But we're not excellent at it. That's where other people really excel. What we're good at is carving out the, the business value with you know, externals like, um, like analysts and connect that in, in the best way to, to a message and bring that then into the PR machine and help elevate the message through that and then and i don't think that the um such a pr piece that mentions another analyst shouldn't go to the you know should be visible to the bro uh, the broader analyst community i don't think that's a problem if as an analyst you have a problem with that i think then you have a bigger problem of, an, of another sort so um yeah i guess that's that's questionable i i would tend not to in that particular instance, just out of courtesy. But yeah, it's a difficult line to tread, isn't it? But again, if you've asked other people to comment on it and they've not commented, then that's kind of fair play. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, right. well, yeah. this has been, did you have any other questions, Chris? Because I just think this has been a great conversation. I'm excited about all the information we've uh, we've come up with talking to Rose. Um, I no, know I we want to ask our, our usual final question. Did you, mm -hmm. did you take that? Well, that was exactly what what, what my question would have been. I mean, uh, with with Rose being in that business for for a long time and very intensely, and having that insight into you know in, in into the startup field, but also into the field of investment companies and accelerators and being in touch with um, with the analyst firms. Who do you think would be your recommendation for us to to um, get onto the state of startups with industry analysts podcast and 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 interview? Well, I would, I have a couple of recommendations. In fact, I've probably got a long list, but I don't want to bore everybody with that. I would if I was going to choose an analyst, I would choose I think probably the first analyst that I ever did a briefing with, which is Rick Turner from Omvia, okay. who I absolutely adore. He's a wonderful man. Uh, although I, I love all the other analysts that I know as well, just to be fair. Um, <laughs> and the other one that I would recommend you had a chat with, who's been very, very supportive of us, is a gentleman called Ian Ellis. And Ian is a consultant, but he runs things like the RSA Insider, which looks at events uh, outside RSA, you know, the after party stuff. And he's oh. done some really interesting stuff around that. But he's also very much involved with the investment community and he's part of a, an investment circle. And, you know, he's he's a very, very switched on gentleman. And he also runs the London Enterprise Technology um, meetups, which okay. is great. Interesting. Oh, sounds like some good good recommendations. Thank you. No, and and well. Robin, we should keep an eye on the on the winners of the Tech Trader Blazers Awards, I guess. Totally, totally. We're going to be right on that. <laughs> that would be fantastic. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well then, thank you, Rose, so much for for being on the show today. It was uh, really interesting to hear your your perspective and that insight. That was good. Great. Likewise, thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. All right. Take care, everybody. All the best. Bye. <laughs>
Absolutely. So if you've been in business less than six years and are at Series B funding or earlier, we heartily encourage you to enter. So again, the deadline's August 21st. The URL for info is techtrailblazers.com. Yeah, all in one word. And you'll find that in the show notes anyway. Great. So then in the second part of the interview, we talked to Rose about her view of AR. And a Rose is unlike a lot of PR pros I've met. She realizes that she is not an expert on AR and doesn't pretend to be. So it is so great to hear this from a PR pro like her. Yeah, which, which is so important. Public relations, analysts relations are two very different things. I mean, they, they sound alike, um, but what's behind them is really very different. Analysts and journalists are in completely different professions. Um, different value streams, different requirements, uh, different policies as well, different commercials, of course, and, and so on. So public relations is basically a one-way street, I think also, as, as Rose uh, mentioned, um, from yeah. vendor to journalist. Um, there's very little, in, you know, coming the other way. So, But analyst relations is a two-way street by design. So yes, of course, you do need to inform the analyst community and there's mm -hmm. There's a lot to be said about how you do that in contrast to just sending bulk emails or in contrast to marketing led briefings. And, and, and that's for another day to talk about. Um, but if you leave it at that, uh, if you leave it at these outbound kind of activities, you're, you're missing the real point, you know, your 70% yes. of the value um, is about bringing the insights into the day to day work of your smartest people, you know? Um, um, yeah, and engaging them directly with the key analysts. Because that's, that's only gonna sharpen your PMF uh, internally and speed up your GTM, but in turn it will build the analyst mind share and confidence in your entire business and open up the opportunity for mentions and analyst publications or even direct recommendations. Yeah, you see that, that that's where the um, relationship really comes from you know it's not from friendly talk um but from the proof of relevance and results that you create uh the word relationship tends to be regarded as something soft and warm um that that you build through friendly conversations but with industry analysts because of their profession um it is it is something they need to be really critical about to protect their own reputation and protect their clients so you can only earn the relationship through hard facts. And that's what AR is all about, um, helping you to build out that rock solid basis for their recommendations. Yeah, exactly. So, so tech focused PR agencies often do some basic outreach to analysts, right? They do some relationship building, but more as a kind of a social thing, which is good, but it doesn't do what you explained. And startups need to know that because if they don't, it means a serious gap. And this is not just what we believe. This is what analysts have told us in the uh, SSIA research. Analysts don't generally have a great experience with PR because it's not the type of engagement and not the form of information that is useful to them. So it's so good to hear a PR pro like Rose appreciate that. She knows the strength a PR, and then how to partner with AR to elevate the game for the client. And that's how you do it. Her point about PR people sitting in on analyst briefings is brilliant. That way they can hear how spokespeople present the company's story and pick up feedback from analysts through the Q&A and discussion. This can help them better position the company overall. Yeah, exactly. I, I'm not sure they always have the time um, for that. And in that AR can can do a little bit of that for them and create material for them to to right. get it, you know, in a, in a compact uh, shape. But ideally, it would be great. You know, they can, they can attend. Yeah. So you've written about this interplay, right? Oh, yes. Yes. Yes, I did. True. It's quite an in-depth um, look into how PR and AR can create a real superpower. Um, it's It's on my blog. Yes. Yes. So listeners, go read Chris's article. We'll make sure it's it's linked in the show notes as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. And by the way, vice versa, Rose's uh, PR side perspective of analysts for startups is, is very astute. 
Yeah, she made a, a really, one really great point, I think. She said startups are like nice, nimble yachts, while large vendors are like oil tankers. And that is so true. The great benefit that startups have is they are so much more pragmatic and flexible and agile to evolve when they get new data, new information, new insights into the system in comparison to large, established, slower moving firms. Yeah, yes. And, and in the analyst relations context, this very example um, or this, this advantage rather um, yeah. gets amplified and can mean direct practical impact on the marketplace, you know? I've had an example where this very ability um, to, to respond consequently and quickly um, directly translated literally to hundreds of project opportunities with one of the top five global technology mega players, you know? Can't say uh, the name of the company, but yeah. think Apple and the like in a different space, you know? Um, and that was within weeks. So um, try that in, in a large firm. I mean, that was right past all those nerve wracking processes and straight with the global decision makers. Yeah. Because that is who industry analysts interact with directly. So startups, stru their, their, struct uh, their structural advantage, their agility, that we all know, we all know that agility. If the, if you combine that with the experience of um, of an AR professional with their guidance, that can mean very direct and very practical opportunity for you to seize. Yeah, and like you said, try that in a large in enterprise, and you'll learn a lot about processes and responsibilities and sign offs. And often, the organization doesn't even have the wherewithal to consume these new ideas at all. Yeah, I've been there. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, some large firms are good at seizing right. analysts inside opportunities. Right. Absolutely. But but in general, you know, the sheer size of an organization, um, this is where startups can not only stand on the shoulders of a giant, you know, think Gartner, think Forrester, think IDC, mm -hmm. um, but play out their full strength, their full advantage um, to seize return on investment on their analyst relations program oh, quickly absolutely. and effectively. Absolutely. So to wrap up, once again, apply to Tech Trailblazers and make sure your PR and AR activities aren't siloed. Multiply the efforts by strategizing together. Hope you enjoyed this interview. Um, as always, let us know who you want uh, to hear about next. Leave us your comments. Um, we look forward to it. Thank you. Bye-bye.